Thank you, Andy, um, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for, for joining us this, this morning or afternoon. Um, so my name is Veer, as Andy mentioned. I am uh, an international consultant at GL Education, working with schools in Africa. Um, and today we hope to give you a flavour of the kind of things, uh, the kind of things that we do really as as an organisation uh, to help support um, your schools with uh, using data to uh, improve and and affect teaching and learning. Uh, so we were talking really from our experience um, working with some top international schools um, as to how they're using uh, standardised testing and data uh, to inform that teaching and learning. So before we begin, um, I'd just like to go through some objectives uh, for for the session um, very briefly uh, which are on the screen in front of you now uh, so just to talk really about kind of uh, some areas around uh, standard assessment what they're useful for uh, what potentially they're not useful for um, as well uh, to discuss how top performing international schools are using uh, standard assessments and uh, particularly uh, the ones that GL education uh, produce to uh, help inform teaching and learning and uh, also to provide you with uh, some information about some of our assessments uh, that, that are used for this purpose uh, in terms of measuring and supporting pupil progress. So to begin, uh, I would like to talk to you uh, about GL Education as an organisation to just give you a bit of background uh, in terms of the things that, some of the things that we've done um, in, in, in the past and recently. So currently we work with over 10,000 schools uh, all over the world in, in 100 different countries. Uh, so all over the world in, in, all, in all of the, the different continents. Uh, and in fact, we've been working with schools for, for 40 years uh, to develop uh, a, a quite a large network of experts, uh, developing tests, which standardized tests, which are used all over the UK um, and have a, a kind of a robust background in terms of how they were created and, and standardised. We also work with numerous organisations uh, within the UK to help develop these standardised assessments. These include King's College in London, the University of Cambridge and the Australian Council for Educational Research that, that have, as I, as I mentioned, helped us to develop uh, the standardisations and also the, the questions for, for all of these assessments. Additionally, we do partner with a number of organisations. Uh, you may have heard of Phobis here if you're an Asian school, um, ESIS in Europe, BSME and in COBIS internationally as well, uh, and, and ASA um, in Africa uh, to, to, to deliver um, our, our assessments worldwide. We do spend um, time and, and money on developing the assessments as well to ensure that they're up to date. Um, and uh, give you the most relevant data that's, that's needed uh, to help you to understand your pupils. And um, in the last five years, we have delivered 10 million digital tests um, to, to students all around the world. Um, and most importantly, I guess, for teachers, that's uh, saved them a, a, a great deal of time in terms of not having to mark uh, lots of tests. So an overview of our mission um, and also at the bottom of the page are some of our key assessments which we're going to be talking about in a bit more detail. So we aim to work in partnerships with individual schools and also groups of schools to unlock the power of education um, through the delivery of insights into ability, attainment and barriers to learning to enable schools and children worldwide to reach and, and potentially exceed their, their full potential. And we do this through uh, the means of a number of assessments, um, which we'll go into more detail about. So uh, in terms of potential ability uh, is the cogn cognitive abilities test, uh, CAT4. We also have uh, attainment tests for students um, during throughout school um, in English, Maths and Science, as well as a baseline assessment for, for younger students. Uh, to help you to understand the students' barriers to learning in terms of pastoral needs and attitude, um, we have a PASS survey, which stands for Pupils' Attitudes to Self and School, um, and also adaptive spelling and reading tests as well to try to help you to understand where there may be barriers in terms of literacy. Um, I'll now hand over to Jessica, who will talk a bit more uh, about some of the things that we do.
Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, we're sharing one set of headphones here, uh, but I promise that we won't be doing this very often. Um, but hi, I'm Jessica. Thank you again for, for joining us. I'm the consultant here at GL Education uh, in charge of supporting our schools in South Asia. So that's uh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, India, and also across the Americas and Caribbean as well. Um, so this statement here from Daisy Christodoulou, um, assessment should improve learning, not just me measure it, um, is I guess our first myth that we, we want to, well, it's not, that's not the myth, but the, the myth about standardised tests that we want to bust. Um, a lot of schools that I've spoken to over, over the last couple of years have um, maybe a negative perception of standardised tests because they presume that they're only to be used for uh, summative assessments. And here at GL Education, we believe passionately in providing you with data that you can use to improve the learning of your students. Um, and our data is really there to improve the learning, not just to measure it. And then we have this um, great quote from the British School of Delhi. So this is one of our latest case studies. Um, data is only powerful when it makes a difference, if it's going to give us the tools to change things. It's data-driven decision-making that we are after. Um, and GL Education's assessments have given us just that. Um, and this is really, really important. Um, you have so much data in schools, um, and it's really important that whatever data you are collecting, it's there to be used and it's beneficial to the students that are attending your, your school. So really thinking about what is it that we want to find out, what change do we want to make, and how are we going to go about doing that? So... What are some of the benefits of using standardised assessments um, as part of your assessment practices? Um, so, first of all, they are reliable um, in that they require all students to answer the questions, um, and those questions are all marked in exactly the same way. Standardised tests are comparable because they've gone through that standardization process. It enables you to be able to benchmark your students, um, your students' attainments, students' abilities, against other students of exactly the same age in years and months. Um, they can provide a really useful baseline on entry. So international schools typically have maybe a high turnover of students. You might have students coming to you in the middle of a school year. Um, and you might not have a lot of data or information about that student. So if you use a standardized test, you'll get a really quick idea of, of their abilities, any potential barriers to learning, if there's any particular support needs. Um, and they can be really, really useful in that way. Um, and of course, um, teacher judgment is, is super important, but that can take a long time when a student has just started with you. So um, it's giving you something to use straight away. They are very fair. Um, and we say here, so experts consider them the fairest assessment measure um, because they reduce the potential for bias and subjective evaluation. They can be used to identify um, key students, so students with special educational needs, students that need greater challenge, uh, students with um, literacy needs. And we'll talk a bit about all of those things as we go through the presentation. And they are consistent. Um, so schools really like using standardised tests because they know they're getting a consistent measure. Um, if you are using internal teacher tests, which you know all schools are doing, and, and um, there's nothing to say that you, we shouldn't be doing that, um, but you don't know if you're creating a test or your teachers are creating a test, that that test is the same as the classroom next doors, or is the same as the school down the road, or another international school in another city or country. So if you're using standardised assessments, you get that comparable benchmark um, on a national or international level. And here is our journey of, of using uh, assessments uh, effectively, and in particular, I've highlighted here our GL assessments. Um, if we just take a look at that purple dotted line, this is the progress of Anna. So we're going to be mentioning Anna a little bit throughout. Um, so her attainment along the bottom um, there in purple over primary and secondary years is gradually increasing. Now, we all know that uh, progress is not linear like that. That's a very neat line. Um, but let's imagine this is a trend line for Anna. And if we only have this data, we only have our attainment and progress over time, then we're not seeing a bigger picture. We're not getting what we call the whole student view. Because if you look at that 
pink line, the pink dotted line um, above, that there is Anna's potential. So by putting that information in there and having that data, we can see that there's now a gap between what Anna's currently attaining and what she is capable of attaining. And if we don't know that this gap exists, then we're not going to be doing anything about it. We're just going to be happy that she's making progress over time. And so this is where um, having a measure of, of developed abilities, of cognitive abilities, can be really, really useful. And so in order to start addressing this gap, you can be using these standardized tests. So we've put in here at the start of um, Anna's schooling, so at the start of the year, you can be using something like the CAT4 to get an informed picture um, for each child, so that baseline on entry that we talked about. Um, you can then use something like the attitudinal survey pass to identify potential issues, um, to identify if there's um, barriers to learning. Um, this could also be using the new group reading or new group spelling test as well. So you're able to identify what interventions, what support plans need to be put in place, or is this a really able student that needs to be challenged? You ensure then that you're carrying out checkpoints along the way, so this continuous re-evaluation of what's working and what's not working. So are these interventions that we're putting in place, are they having the desired um, impact that we want them to be having? And evaluating that throughout Anna's time in school. Um, we can then use something like the progress tests in English, mathematics and science to ensure that learning is on track, to get, gain a measure of progress to do some form of gap analysis, what does uh, Anna learn and what, is, uh, what are the gaps in knowledge. Um, and hopefully by using all of this data, we're putting the most effective support in place for Anna to ensure that when she leaves school that her attainment is in line with potential. So, what is CAT4? So CAT4 stands for the Cognitive Abilities Test 4th Edition. And it is an assessment of reasoning that helps you to identify students' developed abilities and also their likely academic potential. So it's a digital test um, and it's available um, from this September from six years upwards. Um, so you get the automatic, uh, automatically marked questions, instantly downloadable reports. So we're really just taking away all that time in designing a test, marking the test and allowing you to spend your time and energy on using that data. Uh, the cognitive abilities test is curriculum neutral, so really, really useful um, to gain a baseline on entry. Uh, we have a lot of schools that are using this for um, admissions testing um, because it gives you a really good picture of, of the child's um, abilities and possible uh, support needs that they may have um, as soon as they start in school. Um, and what you also will get with the CAT4 are indicators for IGCSE A-level and CBSE grade 10 and grade 12, um, and also include pointers for the IB, MYP and PYP. And what it can really help you to do is um, to shine a light on masked capability. Um, so enabling you to see the true potential of your students and, and whether there are barriers that you need to address. How does it do this? So, well, okay, first of all, what is it used for? So as we talked about, identifying academic potential, understanding how a student thinks, uh, highlighting that gap between ability and attainment, seeing what is uh, current attainment compared with what it, the student's capability is, providing essential feedback to teachers, students, and parents, and we'll show you the different reports um, later on, can be used for setting targets, so those pointers and indicators can be used to inform any target setting. And also, as we said, it can also be used for admissions testing as well. We do have a number of schools that use it for their, their admissions. And what does it consist of? So these are the four batteries um, included within the CAT4 assessment. So there's the verbal reasoning, which is thinking with words. Quantitative reasoning, uh, thinking with numbers, so looking for patterns within numbers. Nonverbal, thinking with 2D shapes. And then your spatial reasoning, which is the ability to um, uh, manipulate images and visual pictures in, in, in your mind. Thinking with 3D objects. So 
To give a little bit more detail about these, if we look at this continuum here, the verbal and the spatial are, are seen as the pure extreme, so they're very different to each other. Um, and student, within the reports, what you'll see is whether a student has a, possibly a verbal bias or, or a spatial bias profile. The nonverbal and the quantitative are hybrid, so they, they use a degree of verbal and, and spatial reasoning. Um, and the verbal with its links to knowledge of English language um, and quantitative reasoning with its links to numeracy, they're the ones that are most likely to be affected by schooling. Now, as I said, this is curriculum neutral, so um, there is no preparation required for the CAT4, um, and um, it, it's curriculum neutral, so previous teaching shouldn't have an impact. But if you have students who have particularly um, weaker verbal skills, or um, maybe you've got a large number of students that are EAL students, so students for whose first language is not English, they may well have particularly low verbal scores. And it's really important that you can identify that quickly, um, because it might be that their other reasoning abilities are much higher. Um, and so it's important that we still continue to challenge them, but identify that we also need to be providing them with English language support. The nonverbal assessment, uh, most like a typical IQ test, um, so that's the one really to look out for if you're if you want to be identifying students with special educational needs. If if the nonverbal score is is particularly low, that can be really useful in, in uh, helping to identify students that may need further screening. And then the spatial. Um, so good spatial reasoning has been linked to a high potential performance in your STEAM subjects. So science, technology, engineering, mathematics, um, and creative subjects so the visual arts and design and technology it's really important um, and before I go into the reports I just want to talk you through um, standardized scores and give you a, a little uh, introduction to the standardized scores um, so here we have our bell curve which shows the distribution of the standardized scores you'll see in um, the middle here uh, so it's the standard age score, so this SAS here, standard age score um, of 100 is exactly average. So the majority of students within the standard, uh, standardization will have scored a score of 100. Um, and you can see the bulk of the bell curve there, at the, well, the peak. Um, on either side, between 89 and 111, um, so the majority of, of that curve there, that's where the average scores lie. Um, any scores above 111 um, are seen as above average, and then below 89, below average. As you can see in the purple box, the international, we do have international school averages. So each year we carry out a benchmarking activity for our cognitive abilities test, um, and also for our progress tests um, in English, mathematics, and science. Um, and if you are particularly interested in looking at the average scores um, across uh, international schools, then please get in touch with one of us and we'll be happy to provide that to you. In terms of going through the scores, um, so the SAS, as I said, that's a standard age score. That's where the raw score is placed on a scale and is then uh, compared to uh, other scores, well, other students of exactly the same age in years and months. The lowest is 59, the highest is 141, and as I said, average, exactly average, is an SAS score of 100. STAY 9, so that stands for standard 9, is a leveled score, and that will just give you a bit of a broader picture, um, a broader overview of the scores. Um, and then you can see above there on the table how they, they link together. So uh, 1 is, is very low, uh, 4, 5, 6 are in the average, and then uh, 9 is very high there. And finally, the national percentile rank, sometimes you'll see it as PR, so the percentile rank. So that's a percentile that the score falls into. So this is a picture here of um, the, an individual report for the CAT4 assessment. So you'll see that you get a, um, each of the batteries, um, you'll get the number of questions that are attempted, the overall standard age score for each of the batteries and an overall mean, uh, a national percentile rank and stay nine uh, for each of the batteries. And that GR stands for group rank, so where that score falls within the group. So we have a look at this particular student. We can see there that the verbal and the quantitative at 96 and 93 are at the lower end of average. 
the non-verbal and the spatial, 117 and 113, um, above average. So this is a student who is probably quite capable, um, potentially an EAL student, potentially someone that, that could do with uh, some additional um, uh, English language support because their verbal score is, is, is relatively lower to their non-verbal. Um, and possibly a bit of a spatial bias there as well, with the spatial being uh, quite a bit higher than, than the verbal score. This is another part of the report here. So here we've got a scatter plot, and you've got the spatial compared with the verbal, so those two extremes there. If we look at the little dot in the middle, we can see that we are in uh, sort of a mild to moderate spatial bias. And on, then, on the right-hand side, we have the implications for teaching and learning. So, as I said, it's all well and good having this data, but it's what you do next that's really, really important. And I've repeated that phrase at the top, assessment should improve learning. So, within the reports, what you get are strategies that your teachers can use in the classroom. It gives you some ideas as to next steps to support those students. So if we take this example here of Anna, so a lack of relative progress in verbal reasoning. So we know it's, it's still within the average, but in terms of relative um, against the nonverbal, it may be preventing Anna from accessing key areas of the curriculum. Um, it may be that Anna's perceived as, as, as doing OK, that she's, she's doing fine. Um, and so we just continually uh, sort of leave Anna alone and I think she's getting on with it. But actually these assessment results, the CAT4 results, can tell us a slightly different picture and say she could be doing even better. We just need to make sure that maybe we're providing her with more specific vocabulary in classes and, and supporting her English language learning. The second point here, so the test to establish reading age may be recommended. Um, just to check that um, she's not having those problems accessing the curriculum and, and, and making sure there's no literacy issues there. So in terms of next steps then, um, it's suggested there that it might be a reading age test might be appropriate. So something like the new group reading test um, may well be really, really useful. So um, this is an adaptive reading test. It takes about half an hour to administer. And it can be used as a follow-up to CAT4. So if you've got a number of students with very low verbal skills, it might be worth exploring that a little bit more. It can help you to assess the reading ability. So you'll get the standard age score, but also a reading age as well. Uh, to measure and monitor progress, so looking not at reading uh, attainment you know, year on year, but also looking at um, the impact of support and interventions, so looking at that progress category as well, and determining then the impact of any literacy interventions that are taking place. And that final point there, um, to determine if further diagnosis is required. So if you have students who are struggling in their reading, so be that um, uh, their decoding versus their passage comprehension, so is it they present themselves as fluent, but actually they're not really understanding what they're reading, um, or is it that they're having problems reading because maybe there's um, some dyslexic tendencies there, then it can help to determine whether further follow-up is needed. So whether that be a dyslexia screener, uh, whether be that be some kind of screener for speech and language, or um, our York assessment, York assessment reading comprehension, um, then NGRT can really help to identify um, further follow-up needs. Go back to the CAT4 now. So here is an example of a comparative bar chart from the group report. So what's useful when we now zoom out is we get to start to be able to look at trends across groups of students. So getting that top level view there. So um, I've separated this out a bit, although I've realized that we've not got the animation on here, so I might just have to talk through this one here. Um, the red curve there, that's the, uh, the, the bell curve there, so the UK standardization. Um, if we take a look at the light blue bars, they are the verbal reasoning scores across this group. Um, we can see that there's ever so slightly uh, to the left. Um, so we've got a slight left skew there. So maybe we've got a cohort of students with a, a number of um, EAL students and maybe we want to be thinking about what literacy uh, programs are we, uh, are we doing. Do we have a, a literacy intervention program? Do we have an in intensive English language program? Do we need to be embedding literacy across the curriculum? So not just uh, making that the sole responsibility of the English department, as can sometimes happen, but what are we doing in every single lesson? 
Um, if you look at, say, the uh, the spatial uh, and the non-verbal, so that green and, and dark blue, we've got more of a slight right skew. So we've got a, a, a more able cohort. And actually, I was in a school a, a couple of weeks ago, and we took a look at the, the CAT4 group reports so of this particular bar chart, and we found that the, the scores were really heavily skewed to the right. So we had a really, really able cohort. And what this can tell um, the senior leaders is that we need to make sure that all of our teachers are challenging the students. Is there stretch and challenge happening um, in all subjects? And how is this going to impact um, on, the, on the results? Um, and this is my final CAT4 report to share with you. So uh, this is an example of um, a CAT4 parent report. So with CAT4, you will also um, have access to parent and student reports. Uh, you can choose to include or exclude the bar chart. So if you feel that um, there'll be too much focus on, on the scores there, um, you can choose to exclude that just to focus on the summary. So the summary is a detailed picture of um, the profile of the student. Um, but the best bit, I think, is the strategies. So there are parent-friendly and student-friendly strategies that can be used to support um, the child's learning at home. And we have the quote here from, from Edubridge. Um, so Dr. Tassos stated that, I don't think I've had a single difficult conversation with a parent since I've had this data. So he's been really engaging with, with parents um, and using this to support conversations and, and support his teachers with conversations, um, uh, parent evenings and, and parent teacher conferences. Okay, I'm going to pass over to Veer now. Okay, thank you, Jess. Um, so we've had a we've had a look at uh, ability of a student to kind of using CAT4 to uh, highlight the the underlying developed ability of a student at a particular point. Another way to use the CAT4 assessment is to compare the attainment of a student at a, at a particular point in time with their with their developed ability so the scores you see in in the top table um, on the slide so the year five maths SAS year six and year seven uh, for two students uh, give you an indication of how those students are doing in terms of their attainment in maths at the end of those years so at a first look um, Eliza looks to be getting just slightly above average so doing well she's 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 attaining uh, just about average for her age. Sandeep uh, starts off doing not so well, uh, just attaining slightly below average, and then um, average, and then in year seven, he's, he's nearly above average, so making progress. It's, the story changes slightly if you add in the CAT4 quantitative uh, reasoning section. Eliza has a CAT4 quantitative score of 94, uh, which means that her quantitative reasoning ability uh, when she did the CAT4 was, was slightly below average, uh, slightly below 100. Um, but her attainment, there's a big discrepancy between this. And actually, she's doing something in lessons, which, which means that she is doing very well compared to her developed ability. So it could be her teaching, it could be her own effort, it could be a, a whole number of different factors. Sandeep, on the other hand, is, although improving, still significantly below what his ability might suggest that he should be attaining. So it's quite clear to see that there's a, there's a baseline, there's an indication of a baseline here um, as to where students should be attaining in mathematics. And when they're not reaching that, you've got some quite powerful data uh, to, to back up um, maybe what your initial teacher judgments are, but also to show that sometimes students are not making as much progress as they could be making. And there are things that could be done to help to promote that progress uh, and make sure that they, the students are reaching their full potential. Um, and there's a, another quote there at the bottom from the RN Char School in Mumbai. Uh, so we found that by looking at the data, our teacher's perspective of each child changed. It helped them to understand the way that their students learn so that they can provide or support them uh, to, for, to do their best, for doing their best. Um, and I think it's quite it's, it's clear to see from this data here that with, uh, with some additional information, teachers can really support the, the, their students to achieve their full potential. So looking a bit more into, into a bit more depth into the progress tests, 
Um, so again, it's a digital assessment um, and the questions are automatically marked with reports that are available straight away. It's designed to be taken at the end of every school year so that schools can see a student's progress year on year in the core subjects. Similar to CAT4, the reports are detailed in terms of giving you information about topics that students have understood well and have performed well in, um, but also giving you a significant gap analysis so you can see what the students' areas of development are and then implement those in the next academic year or next teaching period uh, to make sure that you are plugging those gaps. Analysis is also given by curriculum content, which there are some examples of coming up as well as additional analysis by gender, those that have an SEN and those, have, those that have English as an additional language. And as we've discussed so far, um, you can also use the combination report, uh, which is a separate report, which is provided to schools that do CAT from progress tests to identify underperformance and make sure that when students get to those crucial end of key stage exams, GCSEs and A-levels and, and other national exams that the students are perform the best that they can be and you've ironed out any gaps in their knowledge by that point. Um, and another quick quote as well from a school in Nigeria, the Regent Primary School. So they use CAT4 when students arrive at the school, um, which is kind of the suggestion. And then um, they use the progress test to ensure that the students are making the progress that they should be making at the end of each year. Uh, so some examples of uh, a progress test report. So this is from an individual report of a student. The scores work in exactly the same as CAT4, um, as I've mentioned, so 100 is the average. This student um, is has an SAS of 114, um, which means overall she's doing well, she's performing above average, but then the reports go into significant detail about particular areas uh, that she may need to focus on. So uh, just focusing on English for a second, um, on the right-hand side of the table, you can see that there's a discrepancy between her English skills, which is spelling, punctuation and grammar, and their comprehension. This gives some really powerful information to the teacher of, of, uh, of the student in the next academic year. Um, you can quite clearly see that comprehension is something that she will need to focus on to help to improve her attainment and also make sure that her skills of uh, spelling, punctuation and grammar are utilised as well um, to support her learning. It's also good on a whole group level. Um, you may notice that students in a particular group have very strong English skills, for example, because their teacher have focused on that, has focused on that particular area and therefore their next teacher in year six or, or, or whatever year they're going into may need to focus a bit more of their attention onto reading comprehension for a particular group. Um, there are also, uh, as you can see in the, the kind of the picture at the back here for mathematics, for example, there are curriculum content, the, the, sorry, the report is divided up into number, geometry, measurement and statistics. So you can see areas in which a group has performed particularly well in and in which individual students have performed particularly well in. So they can work on improving areas which they have not performed so well in. Uh, it's not only a focus on curriculum content, there's a focus on uh, process and skill as well. So for example, in maths, problem solving is becoming an ever increasingly important skill for GCSEs in particular and A-levels. Um, and if this is something which is an area for development, then you can work on it early on and make sure that the students are able to access these kind of questions confidently. There's also significant qualitative reporting as well within the reports. Uh, as you can see, an example here, which I won't read out, but um, there are clear ideas for next steps to help stretch the student, um, as well as areas which she has performed well in for her age group, um, and very specific guidance in terms of what uh, the student and the teacher should be doing next to help support learning. Uh, and just to go back to that idea of comp comparing ability and attainment, so um, the combination report compares the quantitative with the PTM and the verbal with the PTE to see where students are meeting, exceeding or qu not quite 
meeting their potential um, and it, then this helps you to then identify what the barriers to learning are and helps you to put into place specific intervention strategies to support your students at the earliest possible opportunity uh, and there is a, another case study from the British School of Jakarta who have, who have described this process um, which is available on our website. So you've had, you have all the data and as Jess mentioned it's it's really important to collect data but it's also more important to, to do something with the data uh, to help you to address challenges for your students and, and hopefully support them to, to make progress. So we've already talked about kind of using the data to plan interventions, to engage students. Uh, we've mentioned the word metacognition here as well. Um, so if students understand what their weaknesses are um, then they can work around those to help them to make progress. Uh, our assessments are intended to help you to assess formatively, uh, to feed forward into planning for future lessons and future terms uh, and years, um, and of course to help you to track progress over time as well. As I mentioned in the progresses reports, you do get significant levels of gap analysis. So for example, with maths, you may find a student has a student or a group has significant gaps with their algebra knowledge and, and performance. Um, so you naturally would want to, to plug those gaps in some way. To help support this, the resource uh, called Doddle may be helpful, um, which is a, a ready-made package of homework, presentations, revision resources uh, to help you in, in the areas that are listed there really. So planning lessons, um, especially to support your spatial learners because they're very visual um, and it's very small but you can see in the background there a science lesson um, I believe which uh, is display displayed in a very visual way to help support uh, students who are particularly uh, who particularly learn in that style. Um, Encourage metacognition with your students as well, so setting tasks which they're responsible for doing themselves, finding areas which they find difficult and testing themselves with self-marking quizzes. And importantly, allowing you to see how much students have learned and track that over time um, with all the results from self-marking online quizzes um, being placed into the online mark book. And when you've covered a particular topic that you're testing, students will then be able to go into uh, this resource um, to be able to conduct their own revision um, to find out, to, to kind of work on their areas of own weakness with um, audio supported visual revision activities. So uh, to help you to, to kind of plug some of those gaps that you've discovered from the data. So to summarize, um, GL standardized assessments have a range of different uses. Um, we've we've discussed identifying untapped potential in, in quite a lot of detail uh, to help you to understand what your students underlying ability is and to make sure that they are reaching or exceeding this. As the assessments are standardized against groups of students they give you really objective benchmarks to help you to see where your students are performing against students of the same age um, compared to students all around the world. So where you might have a class test which helps you to understand students uh, progress within a particular teaching period. Those tests are made by your by your teachers, which is fine and they serve a, a particular purpose. But if you want a real strong comparison against international students of the same age, um, then some kind of standardized assessment is required. As you've seen, the reports are in depth. Um, so there's lots of opportunity for you to pinpoint uh, particular areas um, of deficiency where there are gaps um, to help you to put into place successful interventions and measure the impact of those interventions. Um, measuring progress over time um, of your students to, to help you to, to see whether students are meeting age-related expectations year on year um, and whether they're keeping up with that over time. Measuring the impact of your teaching and learning as well. So you're delivering a British curriculum um, in, uh, in an international context, um, but how do you measure the impact of the successful delivery of that curriculum by your teachers? The standardised assessments give you an idea of how students are performing in this context to see what the positives and negatives are about some of the teaching and learning that's happening within your schools. Um, and finally, uncovering um, unseen barriers to learning. So is your, students, uh, is your student 
does your student have English as an additional language and therefore do they need further support to, to help overcome this barrier to learning? Um, we haven't really talked about the past survey very much, but do they have an unseen kind of attitudinal or pastoral need um, which, which needs addressing um, and which you can uncover using standardised assessments? And actually, sorry, actually finally, um, most importantly, um, the assessments give you a very strong set of data to help you to support whatever your teachers are doing. So the most important aspect of a school is, is obviously the teacher's judgment and and how they're using various bits of information um, to help the students make progress. The data here is just one part of that puzzle um, to help you to support that judgment and help students ultimately make uh, the best progress that's possible for them. There are a um, significant number of case studies um, and there's always new ones coming up on our website um, so please do have a have a look at that um, for further information about lots of the areas that we've talked about and there are also other webinars as well which talk about specific areas um, that we've mentioned um, which are the websites are available there in front of you um, to, to have a look at.